Good evening. Welcome to the March 11th, 2024 work and business session. The Board of Education has reconvened from being in closed session. Board members, we will move to 4.01. I call for a motion to approve the closed session minutes for February 5th and 12th. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Lindsay, a second by Ms. Escobar. Is there any discussion about the closed session minutes? These will be kept confidential. Thank you, Mr. Walter. All those in favor of approving the closed session minutes as presented, say aye. aye. Opposed? These minutes have been approved. We'll move to 4.02. I call for a motion to approve the March 11th, 2024 personnel report as presented. I have a motion by Ms. Lindsay, a second by Mr. Floyd. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the personnel report as presented say aye. aye. Opposed? The personnel report is now approved. We will move to 5.01, our opening ceremony and the national anthem, if you will please stand. the Coxville High School Trombone Quartet. The names are Justin Hall, Aiden Emery, Elliot Wise, and Troy Kimani. The director of the Coxville Band Program is Mr. Andrew Parker. Thank you. Thank you. Board members will move to 6.01 where we are adopt the agenda. I call for a motion to adopt the agenda as presented. I move. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Lindsay, a second by Mr. Floyd. Is there any discussion about the agenda? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the March 11th agenda as presented, say aye. Aye. Opposed? The agenda is approved as presented. We'll move to 7.01, our impact through education awards with Mr. Phil Furr. Good evening. Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Kapiki, good evening. Tonight, we'll present Impact Through Education Awards to students and staff at Odell Primary School and Hickory Ridge High School. Our sponsors for the Impact Awards are our friends at Equitable. At this time, I would like to invite our Equitable representatives, Phoebe San Lo and Lauren Barclow, to join me at the front of the room. Before we get started with the awards, please accept our sincere thanks and gratitude to Equitable for its continued sponsorship of the Impact Through Education Awards. Tonight, we continue our 14th year of honoring those making an impact in our schools with this award. We appreciate your support and thank you for helping us celebrate and recognize deserving students and staff. We also want to say a word of thanks to the Cabarrus Regional Chamber of Commerce and to Concord Trophy Center for providing us with the award plaques each month. Now on to tonight's awards. May I have the W.R. Odell Primary School Administrative Team come forward, please.
Our first honoree from Odell Primary is Avery Marburger. Avery, please come forward with your family. Avery is a wonderful second grade student at Odell Primary School and is a great friend to all. She works hard in school and never gives up. Avery is great with building relationships with others and always makes sure no one is left out during classroom activities as well as during recess. On the first day of school, we had a beautiful new stu student join our school from another district. The student was diagnosed with a chondroplasia, a form of dwarfism at birth, and was extremely anxious about relocating to a new school. Unbeknownst to Avery, the student was not treated kindly at her last school. From the first day of school, Avery embraced her new friend and went above and beyond to get to know her better. The two girls have become the best of friends and can be observed playing together, smiling, laughing, and holding hands daily during recess. Avery is the type of student every teacher would love having in their class. She has a heart of gold and is always willing to help her teachers and peers in any way. Avery is a role model to all the students at Odell Primary School. She always conducts herself in the dragon way, respectful, responsible, and safe. Congratulations, Avery. You're an Impact Through Education Award winner for Odell Primary School. Our next honoree from Odell is Rihanna Patel. Rihanna, please come forward with your family. <clears throat> Rihanna is a second grade student at Odell Primary. She always gives 100% every day. She exemplifies all the traits we learn with our positivity project and is a wonderful classroom role model. It's truly inspiring to see Rihanna demonstrating qualities such as kindness, responsibility, respect, and perseverance. These traits not only contribute to a positive classroom environment, but also set a great example for her peers. She was chosen as an Impact Award winner because she is always so polite, respectful, compassionate, and a friend to all. She is a joy to be around. Rihanna is always willing to share with her classmates and help others. Kudos to Rihanna for being such a shining example of positivity in the classroom and school. She makes her Odell Primary family proud every day. Congratulations, Rihanna. You're an Impact Through Education Award winner for Odell Primary. Also from Odell Primary School is support staff member Dennis Orofici. Mr. Orofici, please come forward with your family. <laughs> Dennis is a custodian at Odell Primary School. He is a team player and always has a positive can-do attitude. He is friendly and seeks ways to support all staff and students. In the morning, you can find Mr. Dennis at the bus lot doors welcoming staff and students coming off the bus. 
Dennis plays a crucial role in maintaining a clean and safe environment for everyone at Odell Primary. His dedication and hard work are truly appreciated, and his commitment to keeping the school in top shape does not go unnoticed. He is reliable and diligent. Dennis helps create a positive and welcoming atmosphere for students, teachers, and staff. We're grateful to have Dennis as his exceptional work ethic and contributions to the school have been impactful. Congratulations, Dennis. You're an Impact Through Education Award winner at Odell Primary School. Finally, from Odell Primary School is teacher Neely Poe. Ms. Poe, please come forward with your family. <laughs> Neely is an outstanding first grade teacher at Odell Primary. She is always there for her students as well as her colleagues. Ms. Poe goes above and beyond to meet the individual needs of her students and maintains a positive and collaborative relationship with the family she serves. Ms. Poe also represents the school by being a first grade team PLC chair, professional development presenter, and being a mentor for beginning teachers. Her classroom is warm, welcoming, and engaging for her students. Whether her students are jumping to practice their spelling words or playing interactive games to practice new skills, it's impossible to leave her classroom without a smile on your face. Ms. Poe works alongside her teammates, showing them different ways to engage students, talking through lessons to ensure her team has a thorough understanding, and providing instructional resources to support student learning. Ms. Poe understands the transformative power of inclusion and welcomes and embraces students from our Learning Connection classroom into her classroom. She collaborates to ensure that every child can thrive regardless of their background or ability. She engages all students and makes learning fun. According to her parents, Ms. Poe is a gift she has created a classroom environment where my child loves coming to school. Congratulations, Neely. You're an Impact Through Education Award winner for Odell Primary School. Got to take a picture on the dot. On the dot. There we go. One, two, three. I got you. Thank you. You're welcome. We will now continue with our March Impact Through Education Awards by welcoming Hickory Ridge High School. May I have the Hickory Ridge administrative team come forward, please? Our first honoree from Hickory Ridge High School is Jordan Lewis. Jordan, please come forward with your family. Jordan Lewis stands out not just for her academic excellence, but for her unwavering commitment to fostering a safer, more inclusive school environment. With a heart brimming with compassion and a mind fueled by determination, Jordan has become a beacon of hope and positive change in her community. At Hickory Ridge High School, Jordan is not just a top academic performer, but a tireless advocate for unity and safety. Her dedication to creating a nurturing and secure atmosphere for her peers is evident through her involvement in various initiatives. As president of the HRHS Save Promise Club, Jordan has been instrumental in spearheading efforts to combat school violence and promote inclusivity. Her leadership within the club has not only transformed the school's culture, but has also inspired other institutions to follow suit. 
Jordan's influence extends beyond the confines of her school as she serves on the Youth Advisory Board of Sandy Hook Promise, a testament to her commitment to effecting nationwide change. Jordan's passion for advocating for school safety has taken her to the forefront of the national stage. With two visits to Washington, D.C. under her belt, she has tirelessly lobbied Congress to prioritize and fund initiatives aimed at enhancing school safety measures. Her professionalism and genuine concern have left a lasting impression on policymakers, pushing them towards meaningful action. Jordan's advocacy has not only sparked conversations, but has also laid the groundwork for tangible legislative changes, making schools across the country safer for generations to come. Beyond her advocacy work, Jordan remains deeply engaged in her school community. As an active member of the FFA Club and Science Olympiads, she demonstrates her multifaceted talents and interests. Whether she's designing landscape gardens for her teachers or competing in academic tournaments, Jordan approaches every endeavor with the same level of dedication and enthusiasm. Her academic prowess is matched only by her kindness and empathy, making her a beloved figure among her peers and teachers alike. In every aspect of life, Jordan Lewis embodies the qualities of integrity, compassion, and resilience. Her relentless pursuit of positive change serves as an inspiration to those around her, reminding us all of the transformative power of kindness and advocacy. As she receives this well-deserved reward for outstanding character, Jordan's legacy of empathy and activism will continue to shine brightly, lighting the way for a brighter, safer future for us all. Congratulations, Jordan. You're an Impact Through Educational winner for Hickory Ridge High School. Next honoree from Hickory Ridge is Bailey Williams. Bailey, please come forward with your family. <laughs> Bailey Williams stands out among her peers at Hickory Ridge High School as an example of dedication, initiative, and unwavering commitment to making a positive impact. She truly is a beacon of inspiration and excellence in both academics and community service. Bailey is the epitome of a diligent learner. Whether tackling complex mathematical equations or dissecting literary works, she approaches every academic challenge with tenacity and determination. Known for her relentless pursuit of understanding, Bailey doesn't shy away from seeking help when needed, often attending office hours and engaging with teachers to grasp new concepts fully. Beyond her academic endeavors, Bailey is an integral part of the school community. As a prominent member of the Student Council, she demonstrates exceptional leadership skills and a remarkable ability to organize and execute impactful initiatives. Notably, Bailey played a pivotal role in spearheading a successful book drive, rallying fellow students to donate over 400 books to Rocky River Elementary School students, thereby fostering a love for reading and learning amongst younger generations. Bailey's dedication to serving others extends far beyond the school walls. As a compassionate volunteer at the Jeff Gordon Children's Hospital, she selflessly devotes her time and energy to the pediatric ep epilepsy unit, often comforting, offering comforting support and companionship to young patients and their families during challenging times. Her empathy and kindness leave an enduring mark on all those she encounters. Bailey's remarkable achievements and unwavering dedication inspire peers and educators alike, leaving an indelible legacy of excellence and service for generations to come. Congratulations, Bailey. You're an Impact Through Education Award winner for Hickory Ridge High School. Next from Hickory Ridge is staff member Brooke Harrison. Ms. Harrison, please come forward with your family.
Ms. Harrison has served as head custodian at Hickory Ridge High School for several years and leads her team with care and compassion. She takes initiative to provide a safe and clean environment for students and staff and is always the first to step up when something is needed in the school building. Although the custodial team has been short-staffed the entire school year, Brooke has led her team with a smile and an amazing attitude. HRHS wouldn't be the same school without Brooke in the building, and we're fortunate to have such an amazing worker and even better individual to lead our custodial staff. Congratulations, Brooke. You're an Impact Through Education Award winner for Hickory Ridge High School. And finally, from Hickory Ridge is teacher Caleb Snell. Mr. Snell, please come forward with your family. <clears throat> Mr. Snell is a dedicated professional who cares deeply about student learning and continuous improvement throughout the school building. He is actively involved in several aspects of the school, including serving as the Social Studies Department Chair leading professional development on culturally responsive pedagogy as part of the teacher-led PD cohort, coordinating graduation, serving as an advisor for the school's VEX robotics team, and even filling the role of an in-house announcer at the school's basketball games. Students would describe Mr. Snell as a creative and engaging teacher who always brings something new and interesting each and every day. Hickory Ridge is fortunate to have such a dedicated educator on the staff who will always work to put students first. Congratulations, Caleb. You're an Impact Through Education Award winner for Hickory Ridge High School. This concludes our Impact Awards presentations for tonight. Congratulations to all our recipients, and thanks again to our partners, Equitable and the Cabarrus Chamber of Commerce, for your partnership. Thank you, Mr. Furr. We'll move to 7.02 with our Hillbish Ford Teacher of the Month with Dr. Michael Williams. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, board members, Dr. Kapicki, and to our viewing audiences both here and watching the live stream. It is my pleasure to recognize our Hillbish Ford Teacher of the Month for March. We always want to begin with expressing our sincere thanks and gratitude to Mr. Tim Vaughn and Hillbish Ford for their tremendous generosity and continued sponsorship of this wonderful recognition program. Our Hillbish Ford Teacher of the Month for March is Katherine Hunter, a kindergarten teacher at W.R. Odell Primary School. At this time, I'd like to invite Ms. Hunter, her family, and the Odell Primary Administrative Team in attendance to please come forward. <laughs> Ms. Hunter, tonight I want to share a few of the 11 nominations you received. All submitted by parents about you. Here are three of the things they said. She goes above and beyond, not just for our students, but for other classes as well. My son loves having her as a teacher. She truly cares for all the children, and you can just see how much all the children enjoy going to school. Says a lot about the teacher. She literally is the best. Another parent wrote in, Miss Hunter is a fantastic educator who leads her class with excellence. My son Carter has learned so much under her leadership. She's always willing to assist and to serve others. In addition, she has great communication skills. We don't miss anything concerning our son's education experience. And a third parent said, Miss Hunter is an exceptional teacher and my daughter absolutely loves her. 
Not only does she take care of all of her kids, she is also taking care of another class as the teacher has been away. She deserves to be rewarded for all of her exceptional work. Ms. Hunter, thank you for the impact you have made to teach, engage, and inspire the students in your classroom, and congratulations on your selection as Cabarrus County Schools Hilbish Ford Teacher of the Month. Thank you. We will move to 7.03 with our Everyday Hero Award winner with Dr. Jonathan Bowers and Mr. Chuck Taylor. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening to you, members of the board, and Dr. Kapicki. If I could have uh, Mr. David Weaver and any special guests that may be with him tonight uh, join us down front, please. Members here tonight, it is certainly my pleasure to be able to stand before you tonight and introduce this month's Everyday Hero Award recipient. Sponsored by Great Wolf Lodge, the Everyday Hero Award is intended to acknowledge the outstanding, behind the scenes, and often overlooked, but certainly above and beyond work of our operation service personnel. This award is presented monthly to an exceptional employee within auxiliary services. And this includes our facilities and maintenance, Kids Plus, school nutrition, and transportation. We all know that there is great work being done every day by these individuals and certainly other employees across Cabarrus County Schools. We want to do all that we can to recognize this publicly. Nominations for this award are submitted by Cabarrus County Schools employees, students, parents, and one recipient is selected each month to be recognized for this particular award. This month's recipient of the Everyday Hero Award is Mr. David Weaver, the head custodian at Hickory Ridge Elementary School. Joining me here tonight is Mr. Chuck Taylor, our Director of Facilities, Mr. Andy, Andy Campbell, our Lead uh, Custodial Manager for the District, and they're going to share with you why Mr. Weaver is the embodiment of an everyday hero and is a well-deserving recipient of this month's award. Good afternoon, everyone. David Weaver joined the uh, uh, CSS family back in 2007 at Harrisburg Elementary School. He left there and went to Open Patriots Elementary School. He did that so well, we asked him to open another school at Hickory Ridge Elementary School. Um, just uh, some of the, uh, I guess, uh, great work that he's done. Some of his past administrators have told me, David is nonstop all day. Another teacher uh, pulled me to the side one day when he was walking the hall and he said, his uh, energy is amazing and his positivity is amazing as well. I remember one time when doing a health inspection with David, the health inspector at the end, after walking this 200,000 square foot facility, looked down at the paper and had nothing written on it due to him and his staff and uh, his care of the facility. Um, uh, he's been shorthanded a lot this year. Last year, he'll come in at three, four o'clock in the morning. He just don't come in. He comes in running, getting his school building there, operational, ready for everyone. A little interesting fact about David, he gets in about 30,000 steps a day uh, in an eight hour period. So he's moving pretty fast. Uh, and um, he's been, he's trained hundreds and hundreds of other custodians at a lot of our custodial training sessions as well. So David truly is an everyday hero.
Thank you. We'll move to 8.01, our approval of the minutes. I need a motion to approve the open session minutes as presented for February 5th and 12th. So moved. I have a motion by Ms. Lindsay, a second by Mr. Floyd. Is there any discussion about the open session minutes? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the open session minutes as presented say aye. aye. Opposed? These minutes are now approved. Thank you, board. We will move to 9.01, board chair comments. Just wanted to take this opportunity again to thank each one of you board members for continuing your commitment to the children of Cabarrus County Schools. Our mission is to provide a world-class education to every student we serve alongside this great school district. I hope that each of you had an opportunity to relax over spring break and that you're ready to dive back in to the work of the Board of Education as the district continues to work with realignment and the budget process. Our next meeting will be on March the 25th in this boardroom from 6 to 8 p.m. at which time we will have the final budget presented to us. We will now move to 9.02 with our superintendent comments with Dr. John Kapicki. Thank you, Mrs. Adcock. Just several announcements to update our public and our board on some of the things that are occurring in our school system. Um, the, ter the teacher working condition survey is the North Carolina Department of Public Construction uh, has released this survey for the 23-24 school year. The link to the survey was sent to all of our teachers' email addresses on March 1st prior to spring break. And we are encouraging all of our teachers to complete this survey by the end of the month and let them know that we depend on this because their participation gives us a, gives us a lot of good feedback um, to assess the current teacher working conditions. So we'd ask all of our teachers to please complete that survey. If they have not received it, to please see their principal so that we can get that information to them. Our kindergarten registration has begun. So the class of 2037 will be arriving in August and this registration period is underway. I would ask all of our elementary schools to continue to put out those communications to the public. And all of our, all of our, all of our elementary schools will hold both day and night in-person events for registration. And for a schedule of those events to enroll a future kindergarten, Please visit our district website and look up the kindergarten information there and you can find the necessary um, information for your child. The superintendent community engagement meetings will begin uh, next week at 6 p.m. next Thursday at Concord High School. We use these meetings to uh, encourage our public to come out. Um, there will be, I believe, eight of them over the next month uh, across the district. We're going to be engaging with the public again to um, talk with our public about what's working in the system, what they think needs to be improved, and what the vision of the system looks like in their opinion for the future as we continue to move forward creating our next strategic plan and extending the last year, which will be 24-25 school year, and extending two years beyond that so that we have a new three-year strategic plan in place by the end of the summer for um, walking the 24-25 school year. So that process begins with, again, going out to our community and asking our community questions as to what they believe is good in our system, what they believe needs to be improved, and, again, asking them what they think the vision of the system should be for the next coming years. I would encourage everyone that can to get out tomorrow night to Winston-Salem at 8 o'clock. Again, our Central Cabarrus Boys High School basketball team for the second year in a row is participating in the state championships. They are in the Final Four. That game begins at 8 p.m. in Winston-Salem's Lawrence Joel Coliseum. Um, it's definitely worth noting that they have not lost in two years. They are the returning state champions. They'll be defending that title tomorrow, and we're excited to see how well they will do. So I encourage anyone that can to please go up to Winston-Salem tomorrow and watch truly some excellent basketball. Um, you have a very rare occasion with that group of kids that have played there for the last two years. They're, it's a special group of kids. Um, I've, I've watched many basketball games over my career as superintendent in education. I will tell you, in the 30 years I've been doing this, I have not seen a team as talented as I've seen in Central Cabarrus over the last two years. They're amazing. So I wish them well, and I will be there rooting them on. So I encourage you all to come out. Monday, March 18th, 
The third nine-week ends for traditional calendar schools on Friday, March 15th, and Monday, March 18th will be a staff development day for traditional calendar schools. We ask everyone to be on the lookout for report cards on March 28th, uh, prior to the holiday break on March 29th. And then we have some upcoming events I'd like to bring to your attention on April 9th from 5 to 8 p.m. Our Cabarrus County Schools will host our annual Hispanic Family Resource Night, and this event will be held at Winkler Middle School. And on April 24th, from 6 to 8 p.m., the Cabarrus County Schools will hold its annual Student and Family Mental Wellness Forum at J.M. Robinson High School. We held both of these events last year. They were both extremely well attended. Uh, so we definitely look forward to our community coming out and, and enjoying these evenings and participating in these events that will be taking place in the next month. On our website, I would ask all of our our folks in the community to look at the website because schools across the district will hold new to school events this spring to allow an opportunity for new students and families to visit the school, meet staff, and become acquainted with the new school prior to the start of the new school year in August. Um, this event and these events held at all of our schools beginning March the 12th and going until May 4th. Every single school in the district will hold a new school night um, so that we can welcome all of the new students that are coming in, it's for anyone that's affected by realignment, it's for the rising sixth grade families, it's for the rising ninth grade families, and truly it's for any student or any parent that wants to visit the school during those evenings to become more acquainted with what's taking place in our schools. So all of our schools will hold those events, so I ask everyone to please participate in them, and that information is on our website uh, for everyone to view, and uh, hopefully you'll get a chance to go out and, and visit your schools. Then lastly, just informing our board and community according to our policy. Um, there were two books that um, have been removed from our system uh, due to the graphic content in those books. One is called All Boys Aren't Blue and the other is called Queer. Um, they have both been removed. They are the second and third books this year that have been removed from our circulation. Thank you, Mrs. Adcock. Thank you, Dr. Kapicki. We'll move to 9.043 with board attorney comments. Mr. Middlebrooks, do you have anything for our board? I do. Thank you, Madam Chair. I announced earlier that, w that we were awaiting the Title IX new regulations from the Department of Education. Guess what? We still are awaiting the new Title IX regulations. It could, they have been projected to be released in March, giving hope to some of us that we might be able to do training during the school year. Unfortunately, it looks like that may slip to as late as June 1st, and if it does, we're gonna face some issues over the summer in getting training done while the majority of the people who need to be trained are no, not on contract. So we'll just have to face that when it comes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Middlebrooks. Okay, board members, we'll move to reports, 10.01, our committee reports. We have several things we want to cover to, um, tonight. Um, first off, Mr. Treadaway has a policy update he'd like to give the board. As a member of our policy committee, uh, one of the policies that we're reviewing right now is our um, electronic devices used by students and staff. Um, uh, we're, as we, and as we're working on that, we know how ubiquitous cell phones are in our daily lives. It's it's a, it's a real challenge, but uh, I, I see the policy committee as the what, and then that uh, Mr. Legrand has created a, a a small working group that is working specifically at cell phone usage, and I like to think of that as the how. How can the what and the how uh, dovetail together? Uh, this is a challenge because the technology keeps changing. Uh, if you look at our current policy on electronic devices, it refers to beepers and things <laughs> that have are long gone for the most part. So it's a challenge of crafting language that'll be, that will endure, but uh, we hope to bring that to the board very soon. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Brian Floyd has an update about the annual chili cook-off. Yes, ma'am. As the president and founder of the board eating committee, <clears throat> I was invited to be a guest judge for the facility maintenance department's annual chili cook-off. And, uh, of course, it was wonderful. Uh, one more bowl of chili, I'd have had to register with ATF probably. And um, everything was delicious, but, of course, the champion 
was a was a, a repeat champion bill van weeren who won the very trophy that he purchased to give out um he got to take it home but really i, I want to take the opportunity to thank the fmd guys and gals for everything that they do uh, they are just unsung heroes of of our district um you know, without them, we wouldn't have a roof over our head. It wouldn't get cool in the classrooms. It wouldn't get warm in the classrooms. We wouldn't have doors that shut. And we're asking more of them than ever while they have less than ever to do it with. And we just really thank them for everything that they do to keep our schools running because it's not something everybody always sees. So I just personally want to say thank you on behalf of the board to, to you guys and gals for that. Thank you. Uh, board members, there's the committee liaison document spreadsheet that was attached to the agenda, and we just need to have a consensus that everyone approves that. Is there any discussion about the committee spreadsheet at this time? Is there consensus to approve this? Okay. Finally, uh, we have Mr. Rob Walter that would like to bring a special professional development opportunity that he wants to be a part of to the board. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and fellow board members. I got an invitation, I guess, to uh, participate in the 2024 Hunt State Policies, Policy Fellows. This is a, uh, this would be the fourth cohort. We have already had a board member that had participated uh, a couple years ago, but this is an opportunity essentially a group of about 20 to 25 aspiring leaders from across the state, including city council persons, commissioners, mayors, school board members, and community leaders that get together and talk about the education policy over three meetings over a six month period. But I think that's a, a great opportunity to, to learn from other folks and, and bring back what we learn uh, here to this board. So I guess there's a policy that says we have to uh, approve that and I really appreciate your support. Is there any discussion about this board members? So I just wondered, uh, what all would that entail? Like, would you have to go to Raleigh, or where would you go? It says there's three meetings here. There's one on May 19th and 20th in Charlotte, one on July 21st and 22nd in the Triangle area, and then on the uh, third one is on September 8th and 9th in Greensboro. And the Hunt Institute reimburses for travel expenses and food and lodging. So there's no cost to me or the board. So. Sounds good. Any other questions? I just want to uh, notice that uh, Allison Goff Clark is involved with that. I, that's all I need to know. She's great. She's a former Mount Pleasant uh, student. Mr. Floyd. I had the opportunity earlier this year to sit in on a on this to, um, um, session. It was very good, and I think it's something you get a lot out of. So, Madam Chair, I make a motion that we approve this. I'll second. All those in favor, say aye. Opposed? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Walter. We'll look forward to hearing from you again and give us an update. Okay, board members, we'll move to 10.02, our budget summary and board report with Mr. Phil Penn. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, fellow board members, Dr. Kapicki. Um, I want to take you through the latest iteration of our monthly memo here that kind of describes where we are financially within the district. Um, what the first paragraph of the memo sort of covers, and you'll, you'll get a sense of this on the next two pages, is we, we've added a new column onto the exhibits uh, that basically show how much money is left uh, in terms of percent of the original budget. Uh, one of the ways you could think about that as a proxy for how much we've spent versus where we are now this year was uh, through the end of February. That would put us eight of the 12 months through the fiscal year. So we'd be looking for anything that looked like it was below 33% left to go. Right. With, with some with some variation, we know there's things that are different timings uh, depending on where we are in the year, but it's a good proxy for something to go take a look in a deeper dive if there's a need that identifies itself. Um, second paragraph of the memo talks a little bit about uh, where we are in terms of the deficit right now. Um, what you're going to see on there is at the time I wrote this, it was $980,000 within the local uh, the local fund two. Um, being specific at the time I wrote this, because we are now sitting about $500,000 higher than that. Uh, two things came through the state last week uh, that they made their final adjustments to our all allotments for teachers, cutting them by about six and a half positions. Uh, that's the equivalent of about $500,000. And, you know, they were very, apologized very profusely for doing edits this late in the year, uh, but nevertheless, we're still dealing with that. Um, 
take a good look at the last paragraph on this if you haven't looked at it uh, carefully yet, uh, talking about revenues. Uh, you know, typically I spend most of my time up here talking about expenses, but revenues are a big part of what comprises Fund 8. That's our special revenue fund. Uh, and one of the things we're looking at very carefully is we may have a shortfall in revenue to the tune of about a million and a half dollars, uh, almost exclusively due to Medicaid revenue that we receive. Um, Medicaid, you know, we are allowed to submit for reimbursement for services that we provide to our students uh, that, that are medical in nature, uh, that we're allowed to be reimbursed for. However, uh, Medicaid, CMS, Centers for Medicaid and uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services, they're substantially behind in reimbursing districts. It's not specific to us, it's something that's I experienced in Connecticut. I've heard other districts lament the same issue down here uh, with other CFOs. Um, but right now we've only taken in about $300,000 of what was projected to be $1.3 million. Now, as I understand it, if you go back and look at history, there's a very big block of money that typically drops in the month of June. So I don't think we're going to be short that entire amount, but I'm raising it as a concern that if that amount doesn't turn up in June, as we certainly hope it does, uh, that adds further stress onto our uh, local budget uh, and our deficit situation. And as I kind of called out in the very last line of that paragraph, any shortfall in revenue in Fund 8 is going to add to the estimated deficit numbers that we've been talking about all year. So uh, it's something we're going to continue to monitor pretty closely going forward. Uh, but, you know, we're in the position right now where every time there's a put in the take, we're logging it in a, in, a, in a tracking spreadsheet to make sure we've got the most updated number at any given time to see where we are. Uh, I would stress we still have three and a half months to go in the fiscal year. Uh, there's a lot that can happen in the final three and a half months of a school district, uh, both bad and good. Uh, but we are continuing to try and make progress against this number. As you know, uh, it, it was 7.4 million at one point. We're continuing to chip it away at it as we go forward. Questions? So, yeah, Phil, the, that 7.4, <clears throat> truly, when I look at this and understand that the, the, the details of this, really was zero. It, it, at you, one point. You got it down yeah. to zero. So we were actually balancing together. The two things that came up were, one was a contractual cost EC that we had to pay. Yep. And then the second one was an unexpected, I believe it was a roofing expense, correct? Or a construction there were some expense. Facilities, yeah, there were some facilities, facilities expenses, expenses, and then there was a, there was a legal settlement as, as well. Correct. That was not in scope. And those were things that we would not have budgeted for otherwise. They no, came correct. up, they just came up in a normal case of doing business as a correct. school system. Correct. So I just want to make clear to the board that the deficit was solved and settled to zero. These, these other things that came up came up over the course of the year that, um, for lack of a better way of putting it, were out of our control. The Medicaid eligible fund, the revenue that um, Phil is talking about, and, and we can kind of go into more detail if we need to, that's revenue that we re usually receive every year, but as he has pointed out that, you know, we're behind in the collections of the revenue that, that we receive for that, which is putting us, putting us in a bit of a stress point as well. Yeah, and to be clear, the district has done everything that's required to do to receive those funds. It's just we do not dictate to the government when they, re when they, when they release them to us. Mm. So again, I just want to reiterate the deficit problem was solved. The finance department did a great job with that. So I mean, Kim, Carrie, Phil, your team did a great job with that. Uh, these are some other unexpected things that popped up that we have to deal with. Any questions, board members? Mr. Floyd? State say why so late in the year on the allotments? Not really. Does anybody know? <laughs> That's somebody not a fair knows. question for you. But yeah, so, somebody knows. No. Yeah. Um, when did we receive the Medicaid revenue last year? In June. Okay. Was the biggest oh, sorry, piece. You said that. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Miss Sandage. So just, I just want to make sure I'm correct. I cracked in my understanding. So we were zeroed out at the end of the year until these things came in. No. Okay. At, at one point during this year, we had gotten it down to zero. Then these other things came in after that and made it not zero again. So. And then that's the reason for a fund balance, correct? It, typically in a year like that, you would use fund balance to make up that difference. Okay. So we didn't do anything like outside of scope that caused the, the deficit. Is that what I understand? No. The, the, these are ordinary course of business activities that were uh, bigger than we expected them to be. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I, I'll save my, my next question for a later time just to make sure I understand what I'm, what I'm thinking through. Ms. Escobar. With the allotments, there's nothing we can do to push back on that? Okay. No. No. And, 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 I, and I asked, 
I asked for some additional detail to explain what the cut related to, and even the, the, the follow-up answer I found kind of unsatisfactory. So there's another contact within the state I'll go tap into to see if I can get a better explanation. Yeah. So I do have a question. Are all school districts across the state and having the same problem, or is it that they allot this money different times to different school districts? So, so it, it hit, if, if anybody had an adjustment related to these last two, it hit everybody at the same time. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Mr. Treadway? So do we have a reserve for, reserve maybe not the right word, I'm not an accountant, but do, do we have a fund or reserve set up for litigation? litigation no we do not does that seem wise I think the broader question is is how do we treat fund balance as a reserve against unexpected yeah, expenses yeah. and as you probably know I'm bringing some language to the policy committee on Thursday to start to address some of that okay All right. thank you thank you Okay, we'll move to 10.03, our salary study presentation with Dr. Michael Williams and Mr. Phil Penn. Welcome again. All right. So to, uh, as we promised, we are here uh, in March to give you an update on the salary study that we, um, the board, asked us to step into a little while back. Let me see if we can get that full screen. If you scroll down, if you click that again and scroll down, it should take you there. Full screen, there you go. There we go. Nice. All right, so I wanna begin just by kind of uh, introducing and walking you through the timeline um, for the salary study. Um, the initial request was February 2023. Dr. Bish and Carol Herndon, the CFO and CHR at the time, made a request to the board to conduct the salary study. In April of 2023, HR and finance received the initial results of the study, which raised some questions about the current employee's placement on the CCS classified salary scales. Um, it, it prompted us to go back and really take a look at um, how things had been set up with salary placement through the last 15 years, 20 years or so. So from May 2023 to August 2023, the Human Resources team conducted a full audit of every classified employee salary scale placement. That's about 2,500 employees. That audit was conducted entirely by hand, um, quite honestly, by our HR team on the Fridays that we were off. Um, they worked uh, from home to conduct literally uh, hand by hand. I want to make sure you uh, that everyone has a grasp of what that looks like for employees hired since 2013. That was a digital hand audit, like we opened their digital personnel file, worked back through their hiring documents. For anybody who works for Cabarrus County Schools, it started before 2013. It involved us physically getting paper files or going through paper files that had been digitized uh, uh, by a company that we contract with for ancient files and they uh, but those were all done by hand to check 2,500 employees uh, salary scale placements. In September of 2023 we handed those spreadsheets over to finance uh, and we asked finance to then take a look at what the fiscal impact was right if the if we were to make adjustments it is important to note that um, there was nothing uh, unethical or illegal about where salaries were placed as, you, as they went along. If salaries were offered, people accepted the salaries, they were there. We did find that um, there were spots where um, there were some discrepancies in terms of where folks were placed, which, which showed up. Again, not, un, not unethical, not illegal, just it did cause a problem when we began digging through trying to say, how do we make salary adjustments? So we handed that off to finance to complete an initial or an evaluation of the impact of what does that look like fiscally if we were to make salary adjustments. They worked on that for, it took them a couple of months because again, those had to be done by hand. Those are not things that can be done in, in mass. They, each person had to be looked at individually. Uh, then in December of 2023, up until now, we've uh, begun working on the, the budget uh, for the upcoming school year. Um, and we're going to propose tonight that this is something that 
uh, we'll, we'll need to be a part of that budget if, at, at your pleasure um, and brings us to tonight where we're bringing you this update. The results of the salary study that we received um, that we've gone back and forth with the company quite a bit on are, um, are the following. The first is that it um, is primarily focused on classified employees. Doesn't mean that we don't value our licensed employees. It, it does mean that much of the impact for licensed employees comes from the state salary funding. Um, the, our county commissioners have, we're now at a 12% local supplement, the highest in the region. Uh, it doesn't mean that we don't need to continue to look at that for licensed employees, but in this case, what we found is the biggest deficit, the biggest spot here to work was among our classified employees. We found district-wide that we are approximately 10% below the market average for positions. Um, that looks different position by position, right? What we know is there's been some work done for some of those classified uh, uh, positions where the salaries have, have inched up some through the past few years, others it hasn't. Well, what they found is uh, primarily we are below in facilities, custodial, clerical, and technology. Those are the spots where we seem to have the largest gaps. Our uh, consulting agency Evergreen suggested new salary scales that are market aligned. Uh, and I'm gonna hand it over to Mr. Penn to talk a little bit more about those salary scales. Yeah, thanks Dr. Williams, appreciate it. Uh, so just to be clear about where we're going here and what the objectives of these new salary schedules are, it definitely will align salaries externally with where the rest of the market is. Um, you know, it, it'll also move employees to um, from a biannual step process to an annual step process. So people will be more accurately compensated for their actual experience. Uh, I think it creates a much clearer long-term career projection for them so they can see what to expect during their time here. And it's the last bullet on the page that I think is the most important, right? It, it gives us the ability to attract and retain talent much more effectively. If we go out and we spend all the time and effort to get the best possible talent, but we don't give them sort of progression on where they get paid going forward, that's what creates the turnover in the first place. And we want to try to address some of that as we go forward. So what's, what's the fiscal impact? So 100% of the classified employees are going to get adjusted to where their right, correct, calculated step is on the new schedule. So all their work history, all their educational achievements will be included in that calculation. Now, our best guess of what that's going to total out to, and again, it, it moves around a bit oh. as you have turnover in your staff, right, is about $2.6 million per year. That's going to be recurring funding. That's it's not a one-time benefit, right? It'll be $2.6 million, and then whatever the salary growth is beyond that each year thereafter. And I can't stress this last piece enough. Right now, that's not currently funded. That's got to be a, current, a funding request as we go to county with the 24-25 budget. But it'll be something that we're going to sort of propose as one of the key initiatives that we have. And given some of the steps that the county has taken recently, we think we, we know that we've got some, some um, ground we pay for us in terms of making sure that we're at market with where our salaries are supposed to be. Which brings us to our, our final slide here, just next step. So um, the salary schedule impact uh, should be included as a part of the 2425 local budget request at that uh, approximately $2.6 million. Um, upon approval of that funding, we the salary schedule would be released publicly. We do have new salary schedules that are written. Um, they are not ready to go out yet because we do not yet have a funding source for those salary schedules. Um, and then once that is done, HR and finance would be making adjustments. That's kind of a combined effort. There are two steps to that when you make an adjustment. One that happens in HR where we set salary and one that happens in finance where they make sure we pay salary. Um, and those two things are purposefully kept separate. So there's a two-step process that uh, Phil and I, our teams would work through to make adjustments to employees um, on the salary schedules based on the contingency of the new funding. That's right. So that's our presentation. If you have any questions, we'll be happy to, to try to entertain those. Any questions, Mr. Threadaway? I just... Uh, You've compared where our employees are with neighboring counties or neighboring counties. Mm -hmm. um, we, we chose cohorts um, right, right. that are some of them local to us, some a little further off right. um, and then some out of state. And then also taking a look at some uh, what the, the private sector market looks like. And, and did we look within our system for consistency? They did. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Miss Lindsay. So thank you.
and I know that um, we've been waiting a while to get all of this information and I'm sure that many of our employees are going to be happy to see this tonight so hopefully taking this to the county commissioners they'll understand um, that we need to make sure that we're paying our employees properly and we'll approve this so thank you thank you any other questions mr. Walter um, yeah thank uh, thank you for giving us the update uh, counter that if we only get partial funding how do we handle that so our uh, evergreen is still working with us if we were to come back with partial funding we would push that back to them for them to take a look and see where does it best fit they would come back with a, another suggestion for us and then mr. Penn and I would work through that to figure out the best the best way to be to, to best serve our employees and this covers every every single position that... it does every classified position okay, and this isn't a merit merit it proposal is annual annual increase of, of some some amount so that's, that's correct okay thank you it would take the entire salary scales and move them closer to the market sure. miss sandage can you just clarify for us the classified folks so that we know who this will affect so licensed is anybody with a teaching license uh, school social workers counselors anyone who holds a license um, classified is encompasses lots of different people um, some of them hourly some of them salaried um, but it's it's folks that are not licensed so in, in HR we, we look at two groups licensed employees and classified classified are the people very simply that aren't licensed so like bus drivers bus drivers custodians, TAs, clerical okay yeah um, transportation mm -hmm. uh, all those folks and that will be every single person it's in the 100%. district percent we will be looking at salary scales again the entire set of salary scales would be re-implemented with new scales for all employees and I know the answer to this but I just want to clarify it publicly um, so if the County Commission says no that will, which we don't we, we don't have it at that point correct correct so. thank you any other questions mr. Floyd they say yes it's effective when we're gonna push for July 1st doesn't mean we can get all those changes in for July 1st, but if there's some if, if circumstance we can't, we'll make them retroactive to July 1st. Very good. Thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Walter? Yeah, this is the first I've seen this, so I'd like some more time to review it and come sure. up with some other questions. Of course. Direct them to you. You got it. Yeah, just send it to, to, yeah, yeah. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Vicki. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the presentation. Appreciate it. Okay, board members, it's time for us to have our guest speakers address the board. It's now time for public comment. Each speaker will be allowed up to three minutes to speak, and an individual speaking for a group may be allowed up to five minutes at the discretion of the board chair to express an interest and concerns related to the official business of the board and school district. The speakers will be called in the order in which we receive the request. A person may not be substituted for a speaker, nor may one speaker donate time to another speaker. If a speaker runs out of time, then the speaker may leave additional information with the board clerk. Statements reasonably perceived to be disruptive or intimately threatening to the orderly operation of the meeting shall not be permitted. Any limitation on public comment shall be viewpoint neutral. The board chair has the authority to rule the speaker out of order. If a speaker or attendee willfully interrupts, disturbs, or disrupts this meeting and refuses to leave after being asked by the board chair, then the speaker may be escorted out and could be arrested for trespassing or disrupting an official meeting. Board members will not respond to individuals who address the board except to request for clarification of points made by the presenter. So we will start with the first speaker, which is Mr. Paul Wanish. Welcome, Mr. Wanish. Thank you. Give me a second to get the uh, bifocals on here. Greetings to the board and Dr. Kopecki. Uh, after the discussion that had been going around about Beverly Hills and the closing, I decided it was worth going back and looking at some other information, just not to say it was the wrong decision, but how did we get there? 
Um, I chose to look at the Cabarrus annual report that was filed last June. And in there, I looked at the financials are at the beginning, ignore that, go to the end and they talk about capital assets. And they talked about 43 campuses you had, and in there, 40, um, all but four were in good and excellent condition. The four that weren't included um, Brown McAllister, Beverly Hills, Coltrane, Webb, and the Opportunity School. Um, we took care of uh, Brown McAllister and rebuilt that one and grew it so that we got a bunch of extra seats there. That was really good news. And then we shut down Beverly Hills, which then moved all the people back into the space you got out of Beverly, out of uh, McAllister. So we're still neutral in the number of uh, seats we got in the district. Coltrane Webb had no plans per, uh, carried forward. And the Opportunity School, the Glenn Center, is classified as poor. It's, it's the worst, it's the only poor school that we have, and there is no activity planned for it that I could find. Um, it seems then that uh, we talk about growth, but haven't solved the problem of growth. And so we somehow need to get more schools because all we have are lots of trailers. And when you look at the capacity we've got, they're measured with trailers. Um, I found out that by going to the Cabarrus zoning, that in the last 14 months, they have approved 3,000 new COs. So if those new schools, if those new homes are for people with kids, that could be an additional 6,000 kids that came into the district in one year. According, we have 34,000, that takes us up to um, close to 40,000, right? And that is a disaster from our planning point of view. So um, it seems that we need to um, find a way to get money. There was some discussion from one of the Cabarrus uh, commissioners that said the board asked for a billion dollars for next year. Um, no details on it, and I haven't heard anything from here either, so I don't know what that was about. Um, that, brings me, oops, to, that brings me to the last comment, and that is this next year we're going to have elections. We're going to have four new uh, we could have four potential changes on the board. Um, first, I thank all of you for the efforts you put out in uh, running this, and especially today, a lot of good information came out. Um, but what I want to see is what you focused on, um, that, that um, somebody that can manage a third of a billion dollars and 4,000 employees of all categories, including the custodials, teachers, and other responsible units. Thank you. Thank you. Our second speaker is Sarah Foster. Welcome, Ms. Foster. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sarah Foster, and I'm here today representing Twin Creeks off of Dorada Road. Just trying to get in front of you once again and make sure you haven't forgotten about us. We're that small neighborhood of 12 kids that was brought up several times during the last realignment conversation before the vote. And in that meeting, Dr. Kopecki, without making any promises, expressed that he felt our points were valid and that it simply made sense to keep for our community to remain with the Cox Mill schools, uh, which are just half a mile from our front doors. Changing Twin Creeks not only creates unnecessary transportation burdens for our families, but also disconnects our children from their immediate community. After that meeting, I was informed by Mr. Furr that a decision would be communicated to us by the end of February. It's now March 11th, and we're being told that there is still no decision available. This has left us feeling very anxious. Our children are signing up for classes right now. My daughter is in eighth grade. She has to pick her freshman year classes by this Friday. Um, plus, the, the meetings that Dr. Kapicki mentioned, the new to school evening events, are this week where they're supposed to go visit their new school. We understand that rezoning decisions are complex and require careful consideration. However, we, re we urge the realignment committee to prioritize this effort due to the immediate significance to our children. We're not asking for any special treatment, just clarity and timely communication. Thank you for your attention and your consideration and we'll be eagerly awaiting your decision. Thank you. Our third speaker is Lee Schumann. Welcome, Mr. Schumann. Good evening. I'm here tonight to implore the leadership of this board and the school system to slow down 
and understand the consequences of pushing forward with recent policy decisions that will have grave effects if funding for future phases of the facilities master plan are not approved by the new board of commissioners. I don't need to remind everyone here that we just had a primary election. You all know the results of those votes. We will have two new members at least on this board of education and two more on the board of commissioners. It would be irresponsible to spend taxpayer dollars on phase one of a plan that's tied to future funding that isn't funded yet for the rest of those phases. Especially knowing that new boards would disagree with that funding, quite possibly halt that funding, choose another direction that they feel is more financially responsible. Like possibly renovating a couple of old schools for tens of million dollars less, rather than building new over-designed $50 million new schools. That's exactly what some of them know and believe. If that's not true, what they know and believe, where are the costs to renovate these schools in opposition of the new cost of construction? Has anyone looked at prioritizing the greatest need in those renovations or just a list of deferred maintenance without any priority of what needs to be done when, what's most important? That's an important distinction. In this current political environment with tax increases coming to every single household, how do you show the voting public that you're spending those tax dollars responsibly? Trust us. We just know. Our eyes don't lie. We're the professionals. We know what we're doing. You just don't understand. That does not fly, and voters are smarter than that. They're smart enough to see that the only reasons to demolish this school are clouded and well, it's just better for all 35,000 students in the system. Well, my grandfather was here today, he'd say hogwash. Let's rush to spend $11 million demolishing a 325 seat school for a new pre-K so we can spend $50 million on a brand new school so then spend more money making old R. Brown a swing school so we can turn right around, spend more money there making it another pre-K or whatever we decide to do. See how crazy that sounds to voters? Spend $15 million on renovating the highest priority needs of two older elementary schools. Spend $11 million where it was intended at R. Brown. Save $20 million. Yes, you have to operate two schools. A lot of that funding comes from the state. It doesn't come from local funds. Yes, it costs more to operate those schools. $20 million. That makes a whole lot more sense. And it sounds silly to have to sit here and try to convince people of that. I'm here to caution you against moving forward with a plan that would demolish the school, knowing the greatest needs in this county are for more elementary school seats. If funding for any new elementary schools change with the current board of commissioners, sorry, the new board of commissioners, you won't just have hurt Beverly Hills by demolishing a school for those children in their neighborhood, but you'll take 300 seats away from the school system that's in dire need of seats. Furthermore, it's been mentioned that the $11 million that's been allocated for Beverly Hills site is use it or lose it funding. Well, that is completely not true. The reason I know that is I confirmed it with the county commissioners by asking them. They said that money can be used anytime, does not have a time limit. So why are we gonna rush, spend money, it's predicated on spending other dollars not yet funded when we really need more seats. That is irresponsible. Take time to understand the environment in which the next Board of Education and Board of Commissioners will govern in. How will they respond? How will they have to respond to the voting public? You may have a personal opinion as to why you believe the current path is better than an alternate one, but you cannot take that opinion as fact nor can you let it influence the decision of others who differ completely from that opinion in a place where they have to undo harm that you may cause. Beverly Hills Elementary School is a high-performing Title I elementary school that should be kept open. That's my opinion. I don't get to make the decisions. That decision shouldn't be made by boards who aren't going to be around to have to deal with ramifications of them. That decision should be made by future boards who need to understand the ramifications of a decision that they make, not something someone else makes. Otherwise, they'll just be left to clean up a mess that they didn't create. Thank you. Thank you. 
Board members will move to 12.01. I'm going to talk. clarification. Okay. Uh, this is from the Sarah Foster speaker. And in relation to communication from the district that we were going to contact them by a certain date and we didn't do that. Can somebody help me understand what's happened there? The, quite simply, there's a lot of moving parts still taking place. We're still reviewing a lot of different things um, to consider before we send out any communication. That's all the real is to it. There's no nothing else to say. Yeah, we shouldn't be, and this is just my personal opinion, I, I don't believe we should be communicating that we're going to get back to somebody by a specific time, and we don't. Um, I'm, ju I'm just not understanding why things like that happen. Can I ask a question, too? Sorry. Okay. Um, so with regards to that same uh, issue, if these kids are already picking out their classes this week, how are we going to rectify that? And when can we bring this up for another discussion? I, I don't think you need to bring it up for another discussion. I think it kind of sits in, in the administrator's lap right now to make that assessment. If any changes were made, we'd come back to the board and, and ask the board um, for that permission because the realignment vote's already taken place. Um, and we're only talking 12 students. That would not be hard to make any adjustments to moving forward. Um, one of the one of the other reasons too coming up is you have the, the the hardship dates are from March 15th to May 15th, so there's a lot of moving parts here, as I said, that we're trying to consider um, before we make any decisions. And I also want to follow up on uh, Lee Schumann's statement. If we wanted to bring up a discussion for what could potentially be an issue with Beverly Hills, when would we be able to bring that up? And I, and I ask that because yeah. per, per last conversation, the plan was to have the school demolished by July. That's correct. But I wouldn't say demolished by July. I would say that the, the, the school will, we will start our process of moving everything out of the school. And I don't have the date in front of us. August 1st, I believe, was the date, or uh, in September 1st was Coltrane Webb. But August 1st, the month of August would be when we would start construction on the Beverly Hills site. So that being said, my, I guess my question is, is it something that we should probably discuss again? Is it wise for us to have a school that is open and has 350 seats available when we just had an, an election where things could potentially change moving forward and the funding that we've asked for has not been voted on and approved yet so we're we're operating under a lot of assumption at this point we don't have anything in stone saying that we're going to be funded for any of this but once that school is gone it's gone mm -hmm. and i understand what, what your, your statement is um Respectfully, I don't agree with a lot of what Mr. Schumann said. Um, in fact, I think it's, I think a lot of what he said is wrong, and not and not factually correct. But that's his opinion, and I have mine, and we'll agree to disagree. Um, you're correct in terms of some of the assumptions. I agree with you on that. Um, but this is the process that we've been undergoing for the last year, almost a year and a half now, and now we're into this budget cycle. I think it's going to give us a lot of insight as to will the decisions that we have made play out but you're right i mean there are some assumptions made up there financially with the commission um and then i would say that, that i understand some of the comments made but this board has been elected to make decisions and must make decisions and some of those have been have been made and then we will continue to bring the information to the board to make future decisions but right now the decisions that the board have has the, the decisions the board have made and voted on or the decisions that we're acting on and preparing to enact moving forward. But I will agree you're hundred percent correct. The assumption is based on some of the financial implications that the county must fund. If the county does turn us down, Mrs. Mrs. Lindsay, then you know it's a discussion that I would have to come back to the board and say, you know, they they've turned us down. Um, I fully anticipate that they will fund what we ask. And if they don't, I'm gonna come back to the board and say this is the conversation we have to have. 
When will we know for sure if they're going to fund what sure. we've requested? That's a great question. Um, I would say that um, John Kopicki's opinion, your superintendent's opinion, I would say that I should know by middle of May. May 15th, I think, would be a good indicator because we have to have our budget. It goes through, as you know, we go through the board process this month and next month. You have to have it to the county by May 15th. I should have some indication. Um, I am requesting a board vice chair meeting to come up this month so we can start discussing with the county what our expectations are. Um, I think that could give us some insight as well. Um, but they're going to have to make some decisions to guide our decisions as well. So you're right. You're 100% correct in what you're saying. I wish I could give you a better answer, but I can't. Um, I think that we are making the best informed decisions we can make as of March 11th, 2024. And as we move forward to have those communications with the county, I will come back and inform the board as to what that what that looks like. Is it possible that, let's just say in April, we decide that we want to add this to the agenda for other discussion? Is that possible to add, do? Add, what do you say, add, add what to discussion? Well, what, what we want to see moving forward with Beverly Hills. I mean, I understand what you're saying, that we voted on it, right. but it was a pretty split vote. Mm -hmm. And uh -uh. with the elections that just passed, there was a lot of people that were uh, not in favor of that either. So I think we need to, when we, when we make decisions, we need to take into account what the community wants. So I would say that that's a decision that you'd have to discuss with your board chair and the, and the rest of your fellow board members as to what goes on the agenda. Um, you know, and whatever is in front of me, whatever you place in front of me, I will work to and work toward. But right now, um, my direction, based on the voting of the board, is to proceed forward with the plan that we have in place. All right. Thank you. So the policy you. 2330 talks about what you can add to an agenda. Understood. Yeah, and I'd just like to say as the board chair that this board voted for that, whether it was four, three, five, two, or it was unanimous, our um, policies also dictate that once the board has made a decision that the full board will support that decision. And so I would have to refer to our attorneys to ask if that can be turned over because I think at this point we've already given, we've given the approval action's already been taken and a lot of work is already going into the plans for this and that's my opinion as the board chair are you asking for if you're asking me to to chime in what i i think the answer to your question madam chair depends upon how a question is brought back to the board table and, and my answer, my ultimate answer as to whether you can do something or not will depend on the way in which it's brought back to the table. Like if it's the same question, you probably couldn't, but if it's a modified question or modified proposal. It, it, it depends. You're, you have adopted a policy in your parliamentary procedures policy that says a motion to reconsider can only be done at the meeting where the action was taken. So at the, at the meeting where you approved the reassignment plan and the closure of Beverly Hills, that motion could have been reconsidered if somebody on the prevailing side of the motion had asked it to be reconsidered. Now past that time, uh, a motion to reconsider, it would be inappropriate. There are different ways to parliamentary skin a cat though. And so there, there are other times when an agenda item that attacks the same subject matter may be appropriate but it would be wrong for me to guess what you guys are thinking politically individually or collectively so I, I will have to reserve until I see it come up but a demolition is different than a closure okay, okay. any other questions Okay, so we're going to move to 12.01, the legislative meeting date change on the board calendar. I need a motion to approve the legislative meeting date to be moved from March the 18th to April the 22nd. So move. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Lindsay, a second by Mr. Treadaway. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, the board calendar has been updated as specified can you say what time that meeting is and where it's going to be in the boardroom 
and it's going to start at 6 p.m. 6 to 7 30. So we will move to 12.02 policies for approval on first read. Dr. Sandy Ward. Good evening. Good evening. How are you all today? All right. Uh-oh. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so I have three policies up for first read this evening. Um, if you look on our uh, sheet, I have, out, I have updated and outlined some of the changes that are happening. So I'll start first with uh, policy 7100, which is the recruitment and selection of personnel. This policy was updated to clarify the age discrimination standard and to comply with recent statutory changes. Do we have any questions for 7100 recruitment and selection of personnel? Any questions, board members? That's a no. All right. Our next policy is 7130 licensure. A subsection has been added to address new licensure requirements for service members and their spouses who are relocating to North Carolina. Any questions, board members? Awesome. And our last policy for the evening is 7510, titled Leave. This policy has been updated to address the new statutorily required paid parental leave. Any questions, board members? Mr. Walter? Did they have to give an explanation on why they want that leave? No. No. I don't, I don't know. Parental leave. It's just, just a checkbox of parental leave. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Board members, since we're in a work session and business session, we are going to approve these on first read. So I need a motion to approve the policies as presented on first read. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Escobar, a second by Ms. Lindsay. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? These policies are approved as presented. We'll move to 12.03 with our budget resolution and amendment number 003, summary of change in the fund with Mr. Penn. Good evening again. Um, let me take you through a couple of documents that we have with respect to budget amendments. Um, you'll see that there's two in your packet. Uh, the first one is effectively a revision of the initial budget that we had at the beginning of the year. Uh, in working with our uh, external uh, auditors, what he confirmed is that we have the ability to continue to change that up until June 30th of this year. As long as we adopt one that looks like it was balanced, we're in good shape. And we were intentional about adopting one that had a deficit to highlight the fact that we had a deficit, that we had to continue to work our way down through the, as the year progressed. So if you were to look at the um, second bullet in the, in the second section where we talk about local fund two, uh, we've reduced in this particular uh, amendment the um, anticipated deficit by $975,000 from what had been there previously. You've heard me talk about the $800,000 that we were going to get county approval for uh, to repurpose one-time funds, and we also did take uh, credit for $175,000 in lower than expected lease payments for landline phones. Those leases had ended. We didn't need to include them in the 23-24 budget, so that became a, a good thing for us as we continue to work our way through the deficit this year. So what you're going to see on that revised initial budget amendment is what is now showing a local deficit of just over a million dollars, uh, 1063325. And as we continue to go forward through the year, we're going to continue to get that to a point where we have both the revenues and the expenses balanced within Fund 2. Um, that's item number one. Item number two is the actual amendment number three, which kind of then takes all of the related changes that we're aware of that's transpired since the last board meeting. Um, so you'll see in within fund one, which is our state education fund, there's an overall increase of just over $500,000. And I've highlighted in the memo what that reflects. Uh, it's the school safety grant for a little over 425000 and the CTE modernization support grant for 50000 
And of course, if you go to the end of the package, you'll see all the different detail that's in there for each of the funds. I did not give you a, a running narrative of all the changes, just trying to call out the highlights here. We just discussed uh, what's happening in Fund 2. In Fund 3, uh, an overall increase of 120000 and that's driven by uh, a, a particular part of the IDEA grant for almost $59,000 and the FAST grant, which supports mental health services uh, to the tune of just under $84,000. In Fund 8, um, an increase of $106,000 related to the receipt of the North Carolina Youth and Outdoor <coughs> Engagement Grant uh, that Boger Elementary got for just under 80, just over $8,500. And then a revised estimate of the indirect cost revenue that we're going to receive for our federal grants worth almost $98,000. That was a positive toward that, uh, towards that budget. Uh, capital outlay. It's an overall increase of just over $2 million, and that was the allotment that dropped from Department of Public Instruction uh, for the purchase of leased, uh, leased school buses. And then there was a tiny piece related to uh, mobile renovations that we received from the county uh, for use of ECHS. And then finally, in Kids Plus and Fund 7, if we can continue to scroll down a little bit, uh, it's a net reduction of about $124,000. Uh, initially, they had anticipated using fund balance this year to the tune of $166,000. They no longer think that they need to do that, so their updated budget reflects that. Um, and then that's offset in part uh, by anticipated indirect cost to CCS of $43,000. Indirect cost payments to CCS uh, were suspended during COVID. If you recall, uh, there was a point in which the board contributed $1.6 million into Kids Plus to keep salaries afloat. Uh, while there was no revenue coming in. So at that point, um, the uh, indirect cost was suspended. Uh, this will be the first time that we've had that since about three years, so the indirect cost is back in place. Uh, this for, it's a very specific number, 42720 which would leave them balanced at an exactly balanced budget for the year. Uh, okay. So now across all funds, you'll see that the estimated expenditures for 2324 is about $509 million. Questions? Any questions, board members? Mr. Walter? How many school buses do we get for the two, two million dollars? Uh, gosh, I don't know that off the top of my head. I'm going to turn to Dr. Bowers if he's around. So we they're know they're roughly, okay. it's roughly about $110,000 to purchase the bus, give or take. I'm, I'm within the ballpark on that. So okay. depending on how, how that plays out, we would. Um, so we have 200 and something school buses and this replaces 20, 20 of them? Or it, it could, again, yeah, I wouldn't, don't. I'm in the ballpark on that number. I'd have to check with Art to be exact on that, but I know yeah, I'm we'll, close. We'll follow up and get you that number. Okay, and then talk to me a little bit more about the big decrease here and restart schools, teachers, and benefits. Do we take off a restart school or how? Why are it's on what page is that? Page seven. Oh no, that's that's just moving money between the two. That that's just normal on course of business. So it's still within a restart school. Was yes. It? Any other questions? Okay, so you need us to take action on this. On both, on both of them, the revised initial and then amendment number three. Okay. Okay, board members, all those in favor of approving the budget resolution and the amendment as presented, say aye. Motion first. Okay. I make a motion we approve the amendment as presented. Uh, do we need to do a second vote or can we combine these? I'm, I'm sure it would be fine to combine the two. Okay. Combine both amendments. Need a second. Second. Have a motion by Mr. Treadaway, a second by Mr. Floyd. All those in favor of approving the budget resolution and amendment as presented, say aye. Aye. Opposed? The budget resolution and amendment are pres Terrific. have been approved as presented. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move to 12.04, our summer 2024 retesting plan with Mr. Carl Sane. Welcome, Mr. Sane. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, Dr. Kavicki, and members of the school board. Uh, North Carolina allows districts the flexibility to provide students with an additional learning opportunity to master grade level content as well as a second test administration to demonstrate proficiency on end of grade and end of course tests. This is specifically offered to students that were not initially proficient on those assessments. Cabarrus County Schools takes advantage of this through the second chance retesting program 
that occurs after the last day of school. Uh, Cabarrus County Schools has used this additional testing opportunity since at least 2019. During last year's retesting session, 1,634 students participated in retesting in grades three through nine. 580 of these students, which is 35 uh, percent of, of the Cabarrus County students, achieved a proficient score on the retest. Uh, I did not put it on the slide, but over 125 students achieved at least a level four or a level five, which would qualify them for uh, potential advanced learning opportunities. And then this increased the overall proficiency of Cabarrus County schools by 1.3 percent through retesting. Uh, this program is uh, offered by the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction, but it has several stipulations. One requirement is that we need local Board of Education approval. It must take place after the regular school year. Uh, this must include non-proficient students and must have voluntary participation. They report the highest of the two scores. So when a student goes from a level two to a level three, we get credit and the student gets credit for achieving a level three or four or five. Uh, and so that that is calculated on the school's report card, also for the individual student, but we do not get credit for growth for that student. Growth, is, growth has already been factored in. Uh, keep in mind that the school report card grades are 80% achievement, which is mostly how many students are achieving proficiency or not. Uh, last year we had 14 schools that were within two points, either above or below the threshold for a school performance grade change. So moving it by 1% could have made a significant impact on the schools. And as I mentioned, it could be a significant boost to students. If they're taking a high school EOC, it could move their grade up for their final grade. And then if they are in third through eighth grade, it could, it could mean more advanced learning opportunities. With a focus on continuous school improvement, we've streamlined the process for 2023-24 school year. So uh, we've created an intentional focus on recruiting the most effective teachers based on student achievement measures. Uh, we've streamlined the number of staff that's going to be involved, so we plan to utilize fewer staff members at each school to increase the reach of the most effective teachers and minimize the fiscal impact. Uh, with, uh, we are going to limit the number of school sites in high school to two or three focus schools. That's going to also limit the number of staff involved so that we can streamline uh, to our best teachers and also reduce the, the financial impact. And then we're going to streamline transportation. So high school students will be asked to provide their own transportation, uh, but we'll, tr we'll provide transportation for all elementary and middle school students. We had over 700 elementary school students participate, over 700 <coughs> middle school partic participate, but only 140 or so high school students participate. The logistics are showed on this slide. So Wolf Meadow, again, uh, retesting has to happen after the end of the school year. Wolf Meadow's school year ends after the rest of the schools. So we have one calendar for retesting for Wolf Meadow, a separate calendar for elementary and middle schools, and then another calendar for high schools. If you recall, high school graduation is occurring on May 23rd and 24th, so we push that back to the following week. So this slide shows we're offering retesting of each assessment. Uh, we're, we're required to provide some instructional time with teachers. So at elementary and middle school, we're providing four hours of instructional time. Students would come in the following day and take the retest. In high school, we are offering one and a half hours of instructional time, and they just take the test that, that same day, immediately afterwards. Uh, in elementary and middle school, we would offer this at all sites. At high school, we would just use select hub sites. Again, that's to minimize the staff involved. Again, I'm asking for board approval so that we can submit a retesting plan to the state. Does anybody have any questions? Any questions, board members? Ms. Escobar. If, if we identify high school students that could benefit from this program but do not have transportation, what's the recourse for them or what can we do? We, we, are, we, are, we do not have a plan to offer high school transportation. Okay. Part of that is the turnaround time associated with providing buses for those students. Uh, we reached out to transportation and needed something about a week to design all of the different routes. Uh, our testing calendar goes all the way up until the 22nd as it is. And so there's no way we'd be able to provide a week of, of logistical planning time to accommodate that. Okay. Mr. Walter. Yeah, a couple of things. What, what is the budget, budget for this? It says here it's 152,500. That's right. For the so, two days? That's correct. Uh, the large majority of that is involved in uh, tutor slash teacher stipends, FICA and retirement. 
So that, that budget, part of the budget, comes out to $93,000 for teachers, $7,000 and change for FICA, and then $23,000 for retirement. If you consider that we've got something like 30 schools in elementary and middle schools that would be doing that, uh, 30 schools, imagine four, five, or six teachers that are supplying the instruction, that's going to come up to close to $100,000. Are they still using assistant principals as site administrators? We're we're hoping to recruit the best teachers at each site. So as a site administrator? That's correct. Because here in the past you had certified staff provide remediation test administrators, curriculum and instruction staff will support, and then school nurses, you have, are we paying them too? That's correct. So we're hoping to recruit the best teachers. In the past, the curriculum instruction department, I know because I was part of that team, provided resources to teachers to use. I can't speak for the fact if that that's part of the plan. And our, I know those already exist, so there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. But and we're feeding the kids too. Is that the that's the plan as well? So there's part expense. of it. That's correct. So if it's a Title I school, uh, free and reduced lunch would already take care of the food. If it's a non Title I school, we would need to provide lunch for them. Yeah, I mean, this is, I guess it benefits more. We've seen more kids involved, obviously, but it's still kind of an expensive program for two days. Miss Lindsay. So, and forgive me because I'm just trying to think about the number of kids that participate in this program. Have we done an analysis to figure out the reason being that they're not able to accomplish the goal at the like during the, the school year? And I ask that because I, and I'm not sure what the normal amount of, of kids are that participate in these programs. But when we're talking about to the tune of almost $100,000 for two days, I'm just wondering, is there something that we could do better on the front end so we don't have this many kids that have to participate on the back end? Sure. I, I am not aware that we've done an analysis of the students that, that became proficient on those tests. I can tell you, I know we're having an elementary and a high school day to dive tomorrow to speak to the point of what are we doing. Uh, we have an elementary and a high school day to dive tomorrow where we bring in teams of teachers. We have the middle school day to dive the final, I think it's Friday of next week, if I'm not mistaken, Thursday or Friday of next week. On those days, teams of teachers and administrators are pouring through uh, different tests, mostly benchmark tests, but all kinds of other data to identify which students, you know, we can reach out to. Part of it is it's a single day's test uh, and it, it's one snapshot on that day. We have a lot of kids that have a bad day or they wake up or they don't get breakfast that morning. They just come in and they get a second try and they pass. Sometimes it's we're offering really good instruction with select teachers and that extra teacher makes some kind of a difference on that day. We have not done an analysis to find those, those, te those students, but I can, I can speak from experience the last year and really the last couple of years, we've got teams of people pouring through the data to try to help students find out which students need the assistance, how can we help them? What are the standards they're struggling with? Um, you know, we have teams of people that are trying to do the best they can, but sometimes the kids just don't quite make it that day and they just yeah. need a second try. And I, and I get that. I, I, would, I would be curious to know if the numbers have increased on the second chance since 2020. Like, I'm just, I'm wondering how, how off are we uh, with these numbers since th the kids have been out of school for that period of time. And if there's something, like I said, that we should be doing on the forefront to even maybe help keep this from having having to be something and, and we may always have to do a second chance I, I understand that but how how many kids will have to participate I think moving forward if we could sure. figure we have that the data. out yeah we have the data I have not analyzed year over year the proficiency on second chance I was I pulled up last year just to see I get what it. The rate was no I, I just I thought about yeah. what could we do to help prevent this you know sure. so thank you any other questions, board members? Mr. Treadaway? I'd, uh, I I just like the name of the program, Second Chance, to be, I guess, as honest as I know how. Uh, it's going to be hard to pour in a whole lot in four hours <laughs> or whatever that is. But the Second Chance does make a difference. Sometimes they're a little bit more motivated when they know they didn't pass the first time. The, uh, I, I am concerned. Uh, it's scary trying to think like a middle schooler, but uh, if they know they have a second chance, does it impact the first chance? Yeah. And uh, I don't, I'm not asking for an answer there, but uh, I, I am 
curious if you know about the percentage, especially uh, through middle school, eighth grade, since we're offering transportation, about what that percentage that take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, we had that, that may be somewhere I didn't see 740 it. middle school kids took advantage of it last year 711 elementary out of, out of how many that were eligible uh, that I have to go back on and I, I apologize no, I should have okay. asked this earlier question. no yeah. it's a great question yeah. uh, I can I can find that we we typically hover or I'm doing some quick math in my sure head, sure so don't take take this with a grain of salt we hover around 60 percent proficient we have about 8,000 middle schoolers. Right. So that would be about 4,800 students that are proficient. Yeah. Uh, that would leave about 3,200 students well, that are yeah. not proficient. So yeah. we've got about a quarter of the students. So it comes down to parent motivation, <laughs> probably. To take when you, when you, yeah, when you do the math, too, you have over 1,600 kids that have taken this, and if you break that down, it's roughly 92 to $93 per student. And if you think about, that includes feeding them, the te cost of the teachers, cost of, you know, bring the kids in it's very reasonable um i get the, the cost of it but i do agree with you that i think anything that we can do to provide our children with second chances and give them more academic reinforcement i think that's a positive thing and we have and continue to and you know mr sand has presented them and that's not saying we can't improve we're always looking to improve but we have continually consistently exceeded the state um state uh percentages by a large percentages so we, we continue to ex meet, meet and exceed and meet expectations consistently again we're, we're focused on always improving the, the, those those data points but we do do well and i think if you can well 1.3 percent may not sound like a lot it, it's significant and if it gives kids second chances to your point i think that's a a positive step for our kids and i, and I will say too i want to thank our teachers because i think you know they're doing a great job in, um, in our schools. We just have to continue to make sure we're supporting them and in, in the instruction. Mr. Treadaway. I, I just I, I did want to point out of the of the money, a lot of that money is going to benefit our teachers, ch child nutrition, yeah. our bus drivers. So it's not like we're throwing money in a hole someplace. It's going right. in somebody's pockets there, yeah. that are delivering good service for us, and I'm. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm, I'm willing to make a motion that we approve this. Just got a statement. Ms. Sandage. So just um, self-disclosure here, my child was one of those children last year. Um, she did make progress, and um, my child comes from a what I would consider a good home, two-parent home, eats breakfast, has the abil ability to get transportation, Wi-Fi, all of those things, and she still didn't make the cut. So, you know, that just goes to show that there are many children that are not like my child and who you know, could benefit. So I, I would definitely be in support of this. Thank you. There's a motion on the floor to approve the summer 2024 retesting plan. I need a second. Second. I have a second by Mr. Floyd, a motion by Mr. Treadaway. All those in favor of approving the retesting plan as presented, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move to 12.05, the architectural contract approval for the Mary Francis Wall pre-K replacement. Good evening, Madam Chair, Dr. Kapicki, members of the board. Uh, Cabarrus County Schools Department of the Construction, along with counsel from Johnson, Allison, and Ford, have reviewed and negotiated with the Yates, Kreitzberg, Hughes Architects the contract for the design and construction administration of the new Mary Francis Wall pre-K center. Tonight we are presenting to you the B133-2019 standard form of agreement between owner and architect, construction manager as construction addition for your approval. The total contract for the design and construction services is in the amount of $552,500. This amount is a part of the total project budget included in the fiscal year 24 capital budget approved last year by Cabarrus County. The fee covers all phases of the design and development as well as the construction administration and final closeout of this project. Once approved, YCH will begin immediately with the programming and schematic design drawings to finalize the overall layout of the building and the required spaces that are part of this new pre-K center. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Any questions, board members? I do. Um, so when does this, does the architectural drawing start this month or when are you once the contract is approved yes and the po is issued to them which cannot happen until this is approved then they will begin design work yes 
And so when will the, the general contract bid so the go out? So we'll do a CM at risk and that'll be brought before you next month at that meeting for approval. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Walter? Yeah, again, I think we're putting this cart before the horse yet. We have not even approved a capital plan that has this project on it. The capital project currently says renovation of Mary Francis Wall Center is at the R. Brown McAllister facility. This board has not approved um, having it, uh, this renovation done at the former um, site for Beverly Hills. So until that happens, I don't think we, we should be moving forward with, with something that's not even on our approved capital plan. Any other questions, board members? Okay. I need a motion to approve the pre-K replacement to Mary Frances Wall. So move. I have a motion by Mr. Treadaway. I need a second. Second. I have a second by Ms. Escobar. All those in favor of approving the architectural contract as presented, say aye. aye. Opposed? No. no. That contract is approved as presented. Thank you. We'll move to 12.06, the construction manager at risk recommendation for the Opportunity School with Mr. Tim Lauder. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chairman, board members, Dr. Kapicki. I'm here tonight to present to you our recommendation for the construction manager at risk for the new Opportunity School construction. We received five uh, proposals. Each one of those proposals was, uh, went through a um, review matrix and the review matrix was then tallied, and the, tally, the review matrix was based on uh, criteria of experience, providing pre-construction services, construction management service for similar projects, approach to the project, ability to meet the established schedule, qualifications and abilities of the key individuals proposed for the project, client subcontractor, and <coughs> design references, that's very important, and the location of the office in North Carolina relative distance to the site of the project. Uh, upon the completion of all, uh, review of all those submissions, um, we are here to recommend New Atlantic Contracting Incorporated be selected as a construction manager at risk for the new Opportunity School project. Are there any questions, board members? Mr. Walter? Uh, this one is on the capital plan. Is it it's within budget? Or we don't know yet. We don't know yet. Where's no, sir. This is we, the, the uh, project is through uh, um, initial design, and right now we're putting a construction manager on at risk, so they will come in and help us with the pricing, early pricing exercises, and obviously any value engineering we can do before it finally goes out to final pricing. At which time, after you approve this contract, we'll negotiate with them to come in. They'll do three pricing exercises. They'll do one now, do one at 90 percent, and then do one final to give us a. a, a uh, cost not to exceed. So we're what's, the, what's the number, 11, 11 million, 7 million for this, or what, what are we? This, this project here is $11 million. $11 million. Okay, okay thank you. Any other questions? $7 million. I'm sorry. Pre-K is $11 million. million. The Opportunity is School is $7 million. $7 million. <laughs> million. It's about 25,000 square foot facility. Any other questions? Okay. I need a motion to approve the risk recommendation for Opportunity School as presented. I'll make that motion. I have a motion by Ms. Lindsay, a second by Mr. Walter. All those in favor of approving this recommendation for the Opportunity School say aye. Aye. Opposed? The recommendation is approved as presented. Thank you. Thank you. Before we adjourn the meeting, I do want to clarify um, for the community, uh, just so there's no confusion. I know Ms. Lindsay made a statement that uh, about the Board, of Ed, the Board of Education in the primary election. We will not know who the Board of Education members are until November in the general election. And I just wanted to make sure the public understood that. We'll move to 13.01, where I call for a motion that the meeting be adjourned. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Ms. Lindsay, a second by Mr. Treadaway. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? This meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone.